let's, let's just start with this conversation. Um, I, I want to ask you, because I, I, we talk about it a lot, but what's, what you, in what you deal with, what is the state of legislation and cooperation with respect to uh, dealing with carbon emissions and climate change in the world today? In the world today, small question. I would say there are two levels. One thing is the state of the international negotiations yep. to create a global framework. I think you would have a hard time to find a businessman who would not very much prefer one global way yes. of doing this instead of 100 different yep. ways of doing it. And their negotiations are moving too slowly. One of the reasons being the one you know that in the United States there is not that big appetite Mm -hmm. uh, to actually commit in a binding form, and that makes it easier for emerging economies also to say that, well, they also will not commit in a, in a binding form. But then there is the other aspect, and uh, in Europe, we really see climate change as very much related to energy, energy efficiency, resource efficiency, and the question of when we exit this crisis, how are we going to create jobs? We think one of the ways we can create jobs is if we are really good at f inventing more energy efficient solutions. Right. Because in a world where when my children will be my age, we will become nine billion people on planet Earth, all wanting right. a share in the good life. We think that even a climate science uh, skepticist should agree that it makes a lot of sense to be much more energy and resource efficient, mm -hmm. to create a better kind of growth. We know that we need growth. But we cannot let the 9 billion people and the developing countries sort of build the same kind of growth as we did in the 19th and the 20th century. We have to have a more energy efficient growth. And we think that if we address energy efficiency, that will actually also make us create more jobs. If you are retrofitting buildings, if you are making efficient grids and pipes and all these kind of things, it creates jobs mm -hmm. that for sure cannot be outsourced to, to China. Could, could I say just one more yep. thing? Because sure. you were referring to the debate. Yeah. As a European, it's not that I do not now and then encounter people who are skeptic towards this sure. scientist or the other scientist, but I must say it's rather worrisome, seen from a European perspective, to follow this sort of tendency of anti-science uh, in the United States. But we're you know, quite good at it. You, you, you <laughs> might be good at that, but it, it, it worries me because, you know, as a politician, I also used to be a minister in, in Denmark where I come from. When 90 some percent of the scientists within a field tell you to do, to take something seriously, I must say that it is highly irresponsible just to neglect it and say, oh, maybe we, we just find some other theory that we belong mm -hmm. to. And, and that is really, uh, difficult to grasp with for a European. How come that anti-science has been almost trendy in this yes, United States? That's an interesting observation. It is an interesting observation. It's becoming more than trendy, in fact, here in the United States. It's, it is worrisome. Ralph, let me ask you. So there's three issues here. One is that let's say you didn't believe that s carbon emissions contributed to global warming. Uh, Connie makes a good argument that that shouldn't prevent you from suggesting we have more efficient ways of doing things, right? Whether or not you think it's global warming, you can look at carbon emissions and say, how, if we can create the same energy without putting so much of that stuff in the air, that's probably just good. Number two, at the time when there may have been some momentum for the United States to, you know, join the rest of the world in, in, in some of these efforts, it still made economic sense to do so. And now there's a big argument that this is expensive and we can't afford expensive things. Uh, and then there's the third category, which you were just talking about, about people who just don't buy the science. They just don't believe it. Tell me what you think of these things. Well, other than that, everything's fine. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, I think all of them have to be understood and dealt with, because what we have in front of us is an imperative for action during our lifetimes, and action that's going to have to continue for at least another human generation to completely transform the world's energy system as much as possible away from fossil fuels. Uh, the evidence is strong enough. That you, the second thing you said was, what if you don't believe that carbon emissions contribute to climate change? Well, I can answer that with a specific. We do know that the world's oceans are becoming more acidic now. 
and the more carbon dioxide we put in the atmosphere, the more acidic the world's oceans will become, and we just don't know how the marine biology is going to respond to that acidity. For example, creatures that make shells, which are important parts of the food chain, may not be able to make shells anymore in acid water. So that's one example of what if you don't believe in climate change. It gets to Commissioner Hedegaard's point that there are many uh, facets of the situation that should give us incentives to take action for, for example, to make the world sustainable for nine billion people living at a reasonable lifestyle, to allow developing economies to grow. All of these things do require energy, but all the signs are, all the scientific evidence is that the planet's ability to handle that amount of carbon dioxide is not up to the task. We have to find a different way. But there are some people who say that there's other science. What do you, how do you answer that? Other what? There is other, there's, there's science that doesn't, that isn't as conclusive about that. I mean, we hear, well, it. we yeah, have it, people come on TV and Oh, sure, that. sure. I mean, uh, for example, in the scientific community, I don't know if any of you know how competitive the scientific community is, but I can assure you that none of us become rich and famous, so to speak, by showing that everybody else was right. I mean, this is incredibly competitive. Uh, I was with a couple of Nobel Prize winners when they got their Nobel Prizes in Stockholm, and the, the microphone comes in front of the face, and how do you feel, stupid questions like that, and then, well, gee, all of your colleagues must really love you more now, and the answer is no, because to make a big discovery either means that you have shown that everybody else was wrong or that they overlooked something important. So the scientific world is very competitive. There are always people looking for different interpretations, different, different ways that the physics is going to unfold. And in fact, there are some questions with climate change. We will never be able, we think, to predict what the weather is going to be like, let's say, in a certain week period in uh, Copenhagen or Brussels or New York 10 years in advance. There is a chance that we can predict the seasonal average of a weather maybe 10 years in advance if, when we get better at it. So when you get down to details of small localities and short periods of time, the predictions will never work. But there is gain to be had by predicting uh, the climate of a season 20 years ahead, 30 years ahead of a re reasonably large region. For example, droughts or wet periods in agricultural reasons and regions, uh, sea level and so forth, where we're getting to be better at it. So at a certain level, the science is getting reliable. The, the smaller the, the geography and the smaller the period of time, the less reliable it is. We're gonna have to learn to work with that information. And that's why, Ali, there is a link to before, when you said, isn't it going to be expensive? I mean, oh. sometimes people tend to believe if just we continue to do what we are already doing, then it costs nothing. And this is very wrong. I mean, if you take science seriously, then it's going to be very, very wrong in this field. And that's why the cost, and of course there are costs attached to do these things, but I think we should more look at it uh, uh, as a necessary investment. Right. Because if we just continue business as usual, and if we over here, if we, we are not taking science ser seriously, then the price tag will be enormous. It will come in form of even more events like we see on the Horn of Africa right now. We will see people start to move in, in the millions. We see mo some of the most populated areas of the world uh, where people will not be able to live and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And it's really naive to believe that that comes for free. There is a very, very big price but tag. But that's a societal cost as opposed to a bottom line company cost. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we're getting some of the difficulty, right? Uh, what is, what is in your research, the most effective way me, to deal with, with, uh, with climates? Go ahead. Let me, let me comment on that. I think it was three years ago, no, maybe it was four years ago, one of the branches of McKinsey uh, consultants, I think it was McKinsey Global, did a study of, I think it was the Fortune 500 companies or some large number of companies in the US. And they concluded that the single item that would yield the best return on investment for all these companies was energy efficiency in their buildings. 
Now, the fact is not many companies have gone on, and there have been further studies to try to figure out, well, if all this money is lying on the floor just waiting to be picked up, or the low-hanging fruit, whatever your image is, then why aren't more companies and more individuals doing these things? And it turns out to be a bunch of little things, like people assuming that if they have built something to code, so to speak, that that's good enough, when in fact code is the lowest common denominator or they don't have the technical expertise to know how to deal with their buildings, or they don't know which consultants or which companies to hire because a service industry hasn't yet started. But this was the result of this McKinsey study that was published three or four years ago. I think it was Diana Farrell was the co first author. Let's, let's think about the effective solutions because it seems that there have been so many put out there. This is kind of like a number of issues that we deal with here. Uh, with our budget. We, we research this. There isn't, uh, you know, there's ongoing research, but we generally know what path the road, the, what, what path the world should be on to cut our uh, carbon emissions. What are the best ways to eliminate the biggest impediments to coming up with a real global deal to get this done? Is it really just the United States? No, I think there are many. I also think that it's very important to, to show the good business cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing is Politics and political regulation, international agreements, it's all fine, setting up targets, it actually helps. Tell, we can tell you that from Europe. Right. It helps when you set up targets, it focuses the attention of governments, it works. Okay. But I also think that we need to activate business. Actually, I do think they are starting really to get rolling. Mm -hmm. They are starting to make the actions now. And they are, often, of course, not doing that out of philanthropy they must be able to see the good business case. And there are two things that define whether it's a good business case. Well, there should be a market, of course, but also if there are savings to, to be done, it can pay off to them. But another thing is to get a price signal. And politicians can help getting the price signal right. In Europe, we have a cap and trade system. Yep. And if you don't like that and want something else, okay, then you want something else. But it's important to get the price structure mm -hmm. right. There must be an incentive to become more energy efficient. Right. We can see that that worked Is in the Europe. cap and trade the best way to do that though? We think it worked because we can see that now in over the last 20 years, we have increased our GDP in Europe with more yep. than 40%, manufacturer output with 36%, and in the same period, our emissions declined, mm -hmm. diminished. So we have sort of decoupled emissions from growth. Okay. We can see that it's doable, and we can see that with the companies who have been part of our emissions trading scheme, they are actually decreasing more than the sectors who are not part of this scheme. So it works. Ralph, is, is, is the, the other argument that is used is that that is uh, something that sophisticated, advanced economies can do more than it is something mm -hmm. that very developing economies... Well, I that, thought you would say more than the United States. More than, <laughs> or the United States. Well, again, a very coal-dependent and fossil fuel-dependent economy. But is that true? Can everybody get on this kind of a system? Or, or do you have to, you know, is it really going to be developed nations that are going to fundamentally be doing this while other countries burn a lot of coal and oil? That's a terrific question, but I would back up. As a, as a scientist, I always try to figure out what the goals are and what the requirements are. And in this case, they are imposed by the physical system, the physics of the planet. The way you go about it and the way to the governance system, we have some choices. Just as one example, and Commissioner Hedegaard is on the hot seat, so uh, I don't have the responsibility that she does, but I'll say that you could go with a United Nations type model where basically all countries should participate and must participate and do participate in the governance. Or, from a physical point of view, we could limit the emissions of greenhouse gases and have the appropriate agreements between just the major emitters. China and the US would be a hell of a good start. Uh, and the goal, the physical goal, is to cut back, to reduce the annual emissions of the greenhouse gases, principally carbon dioxide, but not solely carbon dioxide. There are a number of other chemicals. Uh, to roughly half of what they are now, just roughly. And that's where several other countries uh, can offer contributions as well. It's not just burning coal for electricity, although that's a big part of it. Is, what's the argument that you use against those who say, if you impose cap and trade on a particular area, 
the polluting industries will move, move to a, a, a jurisdiction that doesn't limit it. No, but the way we have handled that in Europe so far, of course we hear that argument because we are yeah. alone in, in doing this so far. That is to give uh, a number of allowances, as, as it's called, for free to the sectors who are most exposed to this kind of competition. Got it. But actually, other countries are now following. Korea has decided to follow ca make cabin trade from 2015. New Zealand already has done it. Australia is now getting it through their parliament. California is moving on. Mm -hmm. China is making pilot schemes for six regions with 250 million people. They are starting them next year. I do not know sort of the details. Nobody knows the details about mm. this, but it's just interesting that they see that you must start also to use the market-based system right. and the price system. Just because a market-based system is efficient. Is that the whole yes, idea? That's we cannot do this without the market. We cannot do this only through governments and politics and things like that. We need to activate the market, and they need to have a price signal for, in order for them to sort of see that it pays off. Ralph, assuming that uh, we're dealing with an audience that, that does believe that reducing uh, CO2 emissions will help, uh, your, that target you just mentioned, cutting them in half, would it help or will it just not hurt more? In other words, can we heal damage? Well, that number of a half or so comes out of a, a physical and biological framework, that is, we think that the, the globe, the oceans, and all the green things on Earth can absorb a little bit less than half as much carbon dioxide as we're putting in the air every year. And the science behind this is just fascinating. It's 30 years of work, and it's pretty darn good. So this is not a, a number taken out of thin air. So what if we did? If we were to have, or perhaps even a little bit better than have, our CO2 emissions into the air, then we would stabilize the atmosphere, we would stabilize the ocean acidity at where they are now, roughly speaking. So the goal would be stabilization. Now, if we fail at that target and we have to end up with a more modest uh, uh, capability, then we could eventually stabilize at a higher level, a, a warmer planet, um, a, a, a climate which is less like what we know today, but at least presumably at some new stable state, and so forth. So those were the, that's where those numbers come from. And we've seen, uh, certainly in the, in the popular press, there have been efforts to uh, illustrate what this could look like. Yeah. And, and really, it takes two forms, I find. One is, is weather and, and land, and the other is water. Those are the two, oh, yeah. the two areas that uh, we can popularly relate this to. And, and, and of course, health and disease and sickness and things like that. But give me some sense of if we don't move in this direction globally, because we do not, we have the capability clearly, we do not seem to have the global will to do it just yet. If we don't move in this direction globally, give me a, a, a picture and a timeline of what happens. Well, that's also the sciences that can tell us something about that. But uh, we already see some of the things now. I don't say that every time we see some strange weather, then it's due to climate change. I can just see that many of the things that we see occur around the planet, floodings there, extraordinary dry seasons there. Mm -hmm. Southern Europe this summer, very, very hot, extremely hot. In other parts of Europe, a very violent precipitation. The water simply could mm -hmm. not go away. You have, you have challenges in the United States, have seen a lot of weather-related yep. uh, uh, events, and so on and so forth. And what we can see is, isn't it interesting how much it fits into the pattern of what the science have told us would be the consequence in the respective area? All these things will become even worse. In the Himalayan plateau, it could be water scarcity due to mm. when, when, when the glaciers have been sort of destroyed, then there is a lack of water. In other areas, it would be floodings. Some of the most populated areas in the world would be cities lying around, very low-lying uh, basins. They will be flooded. That you would see migration from these areas. You would see instability. That is why, for instance, here in the US, the security institutions have very much yeah. warned that climate change is a threat multiplier. It will make the world, as we know it, much more unstable. That is also something that should come into the equation when we talk about what would be the costs of trying to mitigate sure. this. Ralph, is there some possibility that this, this warming of the Earth is just cyclical in your mind? 
extremely small, there's always a chance. There's a fundamental truism that unless you've observed something for, let's say, 50 years, you don't know whether there's a 50-year cycle. If you observe something, like if you're listening to music and you can't hear high frequencies, then you're not going to appreciate that part of the music. Well, it's the same with natural cycles. But the longer this record gets and the better it gets, we're becoming more sure that what's going on in the last 30 years is unnatural. Uh, sea level rise was already happening in the early part of the 20th century, but now it's twice as fast as it was observed just 15 years ago. And the question is how much more acceleration will there be in sea level rise? We know where it's coming from because the, uh, the mass of ice that's supported on the Greenland continent and the Antarctic continent is, is, is disappearing in an accelerated fashion over the last 10 years where we have measurements. Uh, we know that the number of record high temperatures that occur every year, for example, in the United States, is double now the number of record low temperatures. In fact, it's closer to three times as many. So we know that weather still happens. Winters can still be cold, although they're not as cold as they used to be. But the number of record highs far exceeds the number of record lows. The number of extremely intense precipitation events has increased now around the world. So what we don't know is whether the seasonal uh, patterns of rainfall, for example, are going to change. Will there be fewer monsoons or more monsoons. We don't know for sure whether the number of hurricanes that will hit the southeastern United States every season will change or not. Those are really important questions. Yep. But the ones that we're sure of, the signals have become pretty clear. So I'm going to ask you and the question. And they're going to grow. It's, it's, it, it's not really a fair question to you, but I'm going to ask it to you because Connie brought it up. Why is it becoming trendy to take these anti-science positions in the United States in some quarters? <laughs> and, and, and by the way, is it, is it true that it's everywhere? I mean, do you think most people are, are, do you think a lot of people are subscribing to these anti-science notions or do you still think it's fairly limited? I think it's fairly limited, but louder and louder as if people are proud to have irrational thoughts. I mean, just as we came into the room, I got an email from a, a very distinguished former Republican congressman who's always talking to me about how he can get through to his former colleagues because he's embarrassed. I have several friends who are lifelong Republicans in the scientific field, and they're just pulling their hair out. Where did this come from? Why did this issue become polarized? And why is anti-science becoming a political issue? We don't know. Yeah. So. Well, we had, we've had some people uh, in the Republican race sort of pointing that out. John Huntsman, I think, said, let's really be careful not to become the, the anti-science party. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully you'll go back to Europe not thinking that, it, you know, we, we all hate science. I, I, this gentleman, <laughs> of course, will convince me very much of that. And I know that there are very many good American scientists and there is a science community which is stronger than anywhere else, I guess. But it's just seen from a European perspective. We tend to believe we are good friends of the United States. Personally, I believe that the next few years will really decide also who is going to have the strategic leadership of the world in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. I think it's very, very crucial that knowledge is still sort of the foundation for the decisions being taken in the United States. I think it would be such a pity if you lose a lot of years of dragging your feet on some of these issues that is not only important to us in Europe, but even more so with a lot of developing countries around the world who are looking to <laughs> who will have the leadership yep. and help us, guide us in the right direction also when it comes to climate change. Okay, good strong words to end that off with. Thank you, Commissioner Hedegaard. What a pleasure to uh, have this conversation with you. Dr. Cicerone, thank you for your thank bringing you. your good science and uh, that of the National Academy of Sciences uh, to this discussion. We appreciate it. R great round of applause to <laughs>